day, not so long ago, author Eve Schaub challenged her family, herself, her husband, and their two daughters, ages 6 and 11, to go for an entire year without eating any added sugar in their food. Schaub's resulting memoir, Year of No Sugar, has joined an expanding national conversation on the impacts of sugar on our health. Since its release on April 8th, Schaub has been featured on The Dr. Oz Show, Fox and Friends, USA Today, The Huffington Post, The Boston Globe, The Denver Post, The New York Daily News, Everyday Health, and the Yahoo homepage, among others. Schaub has been interviewed internationally by Australian television, Russian newspapers, and Colombian, New Zealand, and Irish radio. In conjunction with her book's release, her publisher sponsored a Day of No Sugar, an event that was joined by over 10,000 participants nationwide. Kirkus Reviews writes that Year of No Sugar is a funny, intelligent, and informative memoir. In the article, the six paperbacks we're reading now, first for women's associate editor, Melissa Sorrells wrote, I certainly learned a lot about the benefits of reducing sugar, but the best part was how much I laughed. Please join me in welcoming author Eve Shaw. Thank you. That makes me sound very busy. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here in Burlington. I'm, uh, as m maybe you know that I live here in Vermont. I live down in uh, the southeastern corner. Um, but I'm so happy to be here tonight, and I'm so happy that you came out on this sort of drippy evening to hear what I have to say. Um, I, I like to start with a reading from the book, um, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. As any woman who has ever been pregnant can tell you, one experiences hunger as if it is a brand new sensation. After my 14th snack of the day, I'd go to bed and have vivid dreams about food, in which I'm pretty sure I salivated and chewed in my sleep. Although I never dreamed I was eating a marshmallow and woke up to find my pillow gone, it was probably close. I craved sweets, chocolate in particular. The catch was, every time I took a bite of anything chocolatey, the most peculiar thing happened, it would turn to dust in my mouth. Literally, it tasted as appetizing as wallpaper paste, so other desserts became, of course, quintessentially important. Thus, one of my most memorable pregnant moments occurred at my cousin Gretchen's surprise 40th birthday party for her husband. I was feeling large and uncomfortable, and the two and a half hour drive to get there seemed much longer. I recall floating my blimp-like self down to the ladies' room for what was my ninth or tenth visit, when I was offered a beautiful slice of pastry, a Napoleon, by a passing waiter. Since I thought it in perhaps questionable taste to bring my dessert into the bathroom to with me to pee, I demurred. I would wait till I was back at my table. Big mistake. Huge. By the time I returned to my table, there were no beautiful, fluffy, shiny little slices of Napoleon left. All gone. The alternative? Chocolate cake. For me, dust cake. Wallpaper paste cake. I sat in watery-eyed silence and longingly, resentfully watched the guests at my table eat their desserts. How could they? I wondered with my pregnant lady brain. I stopped just shy of sending my husband to announce from the balcony that there was a pregnant lady emergency and would some kind soul be willing to donate their Napoleon to a good cause. I kid you not, I have never cared about a piece of food in my life as much as that untouchable Napoleon. So much of one's pregnancy is spent feeling hungry for some unnameable something that when you actually find that thing that will satisfy that hunger, it is as if the clouds have parted and the heavenly choir is singing. And then to have it snatched away, it was almost more than my hormone-addled brain could take. I was on the verge of tears in the car on the way home. I couldn't stop thinking about how deprived I felt, how I should have taken dessert with me to the bathroom, how unfair it was for everyone to have dessert but me. At that moment, it seemed as if there was a big hole in my middle that would remain hungry and incomplete forever. All I can say is that go those guests were lucky I wasn't armed. Of course, looking back, it all seems so ridiculous crying over a pastry. I have no idea what actual hunger really feels like, the kind that comes from genuine deprivation, and for that I am supremely grateful. 
At the risk of repeating myself, I know it's because our family is lucky enough to have enough food on a daily basis that we could make the privileged decision to carry out an experiment such as a sugarless year in the first place. Nobody in our family expects a medal for going without sugar cookies or chocolate bars for a year. But in this land of plenty, it is worth noting the amazing power food and our brain exert over us, expertly tricking us into thinking we need that chocolate bar, that can of pop, that Napoleon. I'm here to tell you that despite everything my brain was telling me that day, I and the baby in my belly that would one day be Greta survived fine without it. And we would survive this year too. No violin music necessary, thank you. So it all began one day when uh, my husband was watching a YouTube video and he said, Eve, you should come watch this. You're going to be interested. Little did he know how interested I would be in this topic. Um, I, I've often wondered if he's ever thought to himself, maybe, maybe I shouldn't have had her come watch this video. This video was the pediatric endocrinologist, Dr. Robert Lustig. And I'm not sure if any of you have, have seen or heard of this video, but it's available on YouTube. And at the time that I watched it, it's entitled Sugar the Bitter Truth. Um, it was, let's see, it had been watched about a million times. It's now been watched more than four and a half million times. Um, I highly recommend it, of course. Um, and in it, Dr. Lustig uh, explains that sugar acts in our bodies as a toxin, as a poison. And he goes on to correlate the excess consumption of sugar uh, in the American diet with every major American health epidemic that we're suffering from today. Everything from obesity and metabolic syndrome to heart, uh, I'm sorry, heart disease, um, hypertension, liver disease, and even cancer. So I was, he had my attention. Um, I thought that was a pretty impressive list and it made, the argument made a lot of sense to me. And everywhere I went after that, I couldn't stop thinking about it. It was as if Dr. Lustig had given me a new pair of glasses. And everywhere I went, you know, everywhere you go in our culture, there's food. And everywhere there's food in our culture, there's sugar. And suddenly I saw it with this clarity. And it was as if, it was like, I see dead people. I see sugar. I saw it everywhere. And no one else seemingly could see it. And so I thought I have to do something about it, but I didn't know what at first. I wanted to do something that would affect more than just the four people uh, in my household. I wanted to do something somehow bigger than that. And that's when I had the idea that our family could do a year of no sugar and that I could write a blog about it throughout the year. Uh, and then other people could read and find out what it was like and what we discovered, what we learned, the anecdotes, the funny stories and hopefully learn, learn something about the topic themselves. So uh, I broached the subject with my husband and amazingly he said, hmm, sounds interesting. Which was wonderful because I needed his help because then we went to the kids. <laughs> and that was a much harder sell. In fact, uh, I remember very well we were driving home from a visit to my mom's house and as soon as they zeroed in on what we were really talking about, they burst into tears. They knew this was going to affect them everywhere they went, everything they did for the next year. And for a six-year-old or an 11-year-old, the next year is forever. So this was huge, and they knew it. And it was hard for me. That was, that was one of the hardest moments. Actually, I think in retrospect, it was perhaps the hardest moment of our year of no sugar was before we even started. Because as a mom, you know, you're used to being in the role of being the one who makes the tears go away. And here I was installing a project on my family that was going to make them uncomfortable, that would make them unhappy. Uh, sure, it, it might make them healthier and it might teach them lots of things, but this was no longer an abstract idea. This was something that was actually becoming real and it wasn't always going to be fun. Um, so that brought that home to me. Um, so we began. And we began on January 1st. And the very first thing I realized was that the hardest thing was not craving sugar 
uh, the biological, you know, oh, I really want something sweet. The hardest part was very um, concrete. It was shopping. Shopping suddenly became way more difficult. Um, where I used to spend maybe 45 minutes in the supermarket, I spent an hour and a half. I spent twice as much time doing in everything that regarded food. When I went to the store, I, I should have brought a magnifying glass and a dictionary because I was reading lists and lists of ingredients in a way that I had never read them before. And I didn't know what all these different crazy 47 letter ingredients were and whether they would be permissible under our definition of sugar. Um, which brings me nicely to um, the explanation of what we exactly meant when we said sugar. Um, now, sugar, the scientific name for sugar is sucrose. Sucrose uh, is made up roughly 50% of glucose and fructose. Glucose is fine. Um, sometimes people get, uh, you know, a little confused and they say, oh, were you trying to do a year of no blood sugar, no blood glucose? And I say, no, I wouldn't like our chances. Um, that would not work out well, I fear. <laughs> um, we also were not talking about simple sugars, which is, you know, sugar has so many different definitions. Um, no, those are carbs, and we were not avoiding carbs. We were avoiding what I now call sugar with a capital S, sweeteners, which almost always contain fructose. Um, fructose is the other half of sucrose, so we've got glucose and we have fructose. Fructose is the bad guy. It's the thing that we have no receptors for in our body. The only place it can be processed is in our liver, and there it creates bad things, toxic byproducts. Um, so what we specifically defined as added sugar um, was, and off the table for us, was anything that contained extracted fructose. So fructose is usually taken uh, from, you know, cane, uh, uh, the cane plant or sugar beets um, and, and can be taken from other places as well, but th those are the two most common. Um, and infused into virtually everything in our food supply. Um, one thing I found when I went to the store was that there's almost nothing that the food manufacturers will not try to put sugar in once you start to look. I found sugar in chicken broth, beef broth, uh, tortellini, smoked salmon, baby food and formula, gravies, dressings, tomato sauce, uh, every salad dressing, bread. I, we went through actually uh, one day and we counted all the different sandwich breads that were available in that gigantic bread aisle they have in the supermarket. We counted 250 different varieties of bread. We found one that did not contain added sugar. So that was a tiring afternoon. <laughs> but it impressed upon me how uh, rampant this is and how little we maybe know about it. Um, so. Fortunately, after I'd done that recon work and I had done the extra ingredient looking up and reading of all the ingredients, it actually got much easier very quickly um, because I would know, okay, out of all the tomato sauces, there's only one I can buy. Out of all the crackers, there's only one or two I can buy. And so I would go to the store and actually then my shopping became much faster and easier because it was very limited. <laughs> um, often people ask me, uh, what about fruit? Now, fruit is a source of fructose, um, but for us, the reason that we could eat fruit was because it was wrapped in its original container. Uh, the, and as, if you uh, read uh, Dr. Lustig's book or watch his video, he goes into a lot more detail about this, but he talks about how fruit uh, has uh, the original fiber and micronutrients. You get a lot more fiber and micronutrients than you're getting fructose, which is a very small amount. And it's basically the antidote to the poison. The fiber is slowing the absorption of the fructose, and you're getting all kinds of wonderful benefits from the micronutrients and fiber. The fructose is relatively small by comparison, as opposed to what we do, you know, so here you have the apple um, and the tiny little amount of fructose that you're going to find in that apple, as opposed to a glass of apple juice. How many apples are in that glass of juice? Many, way more than you could ever find room in your body to actually eat. So nature gets it right, but human beings, because we have big brains, we take the part that we like the very, very best and we extract it, and then we spray it all over our food supply. Um, so that's, that's where uh, we, we did do fruit, 
and we did do dried fruit. We did not do fruit juice. Um, oh, and you can go your whole life and never eat fructose and never be the worse off for it. I always like to point that out. People often will say to me, but don't we need sugar? And I say, if by sugar you mean fructose, the answer is no. Um, I like to liken sugar to tobacco because when we say it's poison, when we say it's a toxin, we're not saying it's like rat poison where you take one bite and you keel over and you're dead, obviously. Um, instead, we're talking a long-term toxin that over time, you know, you can have a cigarette today, tomorrow, next week, next year, you can do it for decades. But now we've all as a society come to the realization that ultimately it's very likely that at some point there are going to be very negative health consequences as a result of that. It's not going to be, it's not necessarily going to be right away. And in each person, those effects may play out differently. But they're almost always really bad and catastrophic. The same is true with sugar. So all those different maladies that I mentioned at the beginning, obesity, metabolic syndrome, heart disease, uh, liver failure, all these things can all correlate back to our extremely excessive consumption of sugar. Um, and why is it in our food supply in such uh, uh, an overwhelming way? Well, there are a lot of reasons, and none of them have to do with our health, of course. Uh, one of the reasons, of course, is taste. Um, but it's not just that it's making those products that we're buying at the store taste better. It's also covering up yucky tastes that are perhaps in that product um, that they don't want you to uh, be perceiving, especially if they are advertising this product as fat-free. We've taken all the fat out. Isn't that fabulous? But it's going to taste like cardboard. So we'll put a whole bunch of sugar in it so you'll never notice. Um, it acts as a preservative. So again, you can put these products on the shelf and they can sit there for a long time. That's great for the food manufacturers. Um, and it's very inexpensive, so it works as a great filler ingredient. You know, none of those are, are uh, really awesome reasons to eat sugar, but they work well uh, economically for the companies. Um, so what happened when we stopped eating added sugar? Um, a lot of things happened, but they took a while to play out. One thing that I noticed after quite a while a uh, few months, really, uh, that, uh, that so was something that I never really thought was something that could be addressed by not. It never occurred to me that this was a problem that could be solved. I had always had trouble with having enough energy. I was the kind of person who they're targeting those five-hour energy drinks towards. I'd get middle of the afternoon, not every day, but regularly, and I would just crash. And what I found when I wasn't eating added sugar was that all of a sudden I had plenty of energy, and my crashes disappeared. Um, another thing that I gave a lot of thought to, and I wrote about in my blog, and I write about in the book, um, was the fact that how do you measure health? You know, especially when you're talking about a long-term toxin, we're talking about something that is going to affect our health over decades. So in one measly year, what could we possibly observe? Well, one thing we did observe was that not only did we feel healthier, but when I went back and I compared my, my two girls' uh, absences from school from the year prior to the year of no sugar. They went from missing 10 and 15 days of school to missing two or three. So that was another piece of the puzzle for me. It wasn't just placebo effect. There actually was a little bit of evidence to support the idea that we were, in fact, healthier. Um, and our palate changed. And this was another thing that I suspected would happen. But I didn't realize quite how dramatic it would be. Um, we had a rule that we could have one sugar-containing treat per month. And if it was your birthday that month, you got to pick the treat. So my daughter Ilsa was turning six. She decided she wanted to have chocolate cupcakes in January. And that's what we did. And she had her friends over. And um, we enjoyed it, and we didn't think any more about it. And as the months went on, you know, we spent tremendous amounts of energy and emotion discussing what the next treat would be. We had plenty of time on our hands to think about it and plot and scheme and what, you know, if you're on a desert island and you could only take 12 desserts with you, what would they be? And so we, we gave that an inordinate amount of thought. Um, but what we noticed also was that as time went on, we enjoyed the treats less and less. 
Um, and it didn't really register to me that that's what was happening until we got all the way to September, which was when my husband has his birthday. And he requested, since he was having the birthday, he got to decide that he wanted me to make a banana cream pie. And this thing, we'd had it before, and we knew we loved it. So everybody was all excited. And I spent all afternoon making this ridiculous, obscene thing. There were like four different recipes that went into it, from the crust to the custard, and then there's cream on top, and then you have the caramel glaze, and then you shave chocolate on top of that. And we all sat down, and we were very excited, and we took one bite, and it was really awful. It was so sweet to us. And we had had this before, and we loved it. I took two bites, I got a pounding headache, I had to go lie down, I felt awful. And I was in shock because it didn't occur to me that this could ever happen, that it would be that dramatic. Um, nobody finished their piece uh, of pie, and I had to go brush my teeth. I had to get that awful syrupy taste out of my mouth. Um, so that showed us that it was really quite a lot more dramatic than perhaps we had anticipated. A lot of people ask me also if we lost weight. And an, I'm, I hate to disappoint people, we didn't. Um, we weren't looking to lose weight. We were lucky that nobody in our family really had a, an issue with weight, and so it wasn't a problem that we were looking to solve. Um, however, da, uh, David Gillespie is an Australian author. He wrote the, in, and he writes on the topic of sugar as well. Uh, he has a book in Australia entitled Sweet Poison, and he was a great inspiration to me during our year as well. He wrote the introduction to the book, and he writes about how he lost 90 pounds um, simply by cutting out eating added sugar in his food. He now eats no added sugar whatsoever. And in fact, he wasn't a writer. He was, he's an attorney. Um, but so many people were bugging him, going, how did you do that? How did you lose so much weight? You were really overweight, and now you're not. He kept telling them, I just stopped eating added sugar, and nobody believed him. So he said, fine, I'll write a book, and then you can read that, and it makes the argument, and so that's what he did. And it's become incredibly successful in Australia. I highly recommend the book. Um, and in fact, he's basically, as a result, the father of a burgeoning no-sugar movement in Australia. In fact, I was lucky, I write in the book, I had a chance to meet him for lunch. I drove down to New York City, he was in town, and he told me the story of how his kids go to school now and they make provisions for the kids in school who don't eat added sugar. So just like they have the nut-free kids and they have the allergy you know, of all stripes and what have you, they also have the kids who don't eat added sugar. That blew my mind. Um, and I wondered if that was something we'd ever see here. Um, so let's see. I'd like to do another reading. This is, this, uh, chapter is entitled Waitresses Hate Us. Um, and I was pretty sure that they must, even though we were very lucky because we never experienced any outright hostility. I kept waiting for somebody to tell us to go take a hike or that we were insane, and that never happened actually. Um, but I had to figure, okay, with all our questions, you know, they've never heard this stuff before. We ultimately got it down to a pretty good routine, and that's when I came up with the official waitress interrogating primer, or how to make sure your food is free of fructose, if not waitress spit. <laughs> Number one, have your meal at an off time to ensure you can take a few minutes for questions without pissing off the entire restaurant. Early is better than later, of course, since by 9 p.m. your waiter or waitress may be out of patience for the evening. Two. I prefer to let the wait person settle us in and get us drinks. Girls, would you like water or milk? Before attacking her with our concerns. When in the absence of milk, the wait person helpfully offers the kids yoo-hoo. Girls, would you like water or partially hydrogenated soybean oil? Politely wave off the suggestion and order them water. Three, when drinks are brought back, broach the subject. I like to say, I'm sorry, but sugar in any form makes me immediately and violently ill. Can you recommend a menu item that wouldn't involve me frightening your other customers? <laughs> or, ever since we came to the realization that sugar is the devil's food, we've been abstaining from it. Would you like to read some complimentary literature on the subject? <laughs> okay, actually, what I really say is this, verbatim, every time. 
I have a bit of a strange question. We're not eating, ever so subtle pause, followed by delicate emphasis, any added sugar. Follow up pause. I was looking at the sauteed beef tongue and I was concerned about the sauce. Do you think you could check with the kitchen for me on that? And then, and this is key, before your waiter disappears into the great maw of the kitchen, never to return again, quickly ask about any other items your family is considering ordering. Although he or she might be temporarily annoyed at having to deviate from the ordinary waiter-client script, believe me, he or she will appreciate not having to make seven separate trips to interrogate the chef. And you won't have to have your dinner at one in the morning while the cleanup crew vacuums ever so subtly under your feet. Four, always be excessively grateful for the extra time your weight person has dedicated to your crazy ass requests. Thank you again for your help. Goes a long way if you ever want to return to this establishment. And so does a generous tip, which I highly recommend unless they pulled the disappearing wait staff trick on you. In our year, we found it helpful and a relief to get to know the menus of the restaurants in our area and which items on the menu we could have without fear of sugar sneaking. We were lucky to find one wonderful, reasonably priced bistro nearby that made nearly everything from scratch and whose waitresses became so used to our requests that they would know what we wanted before we ordered it and who regularly asked us how the no sugar thing was going. The kind of place where the specials are written in colorful marker on a piece of cardstock. The kind of place where they put homemade French bread pizza on the children's menu simply because Ilsa requested it so often. This familiar establishment practically brought, brought tears of gratitude to my eyes at the end of a week of cooking sauces, breads, and chicken broth from scratch. All I can say is, thank God for the trolley stop in Poultney, Vermont. Please tell them I sent you. Sadly, the trolley stop, since this came out, has now changed format and is totally different now. It still has the same name, but it's, it's totally different now, sadly. Um, so another question that I frequently get from people is, well, what happened after the year was over? And I think a lot of people, uh, a lot of our friends and relatives expected like, you know, cotton candy party at the Schaub's house, you know, woo, we're gonna make up for lost time, we're gonna totally go crazy on sugar and eat everything in sight. And that is not at all what happened and partially that was because, as I mentioned with the talk about our taste buds and our palates changing, we didn't really have that inclination anymore. It was really well gone. Um, sure, we stayed up till midnight and everybody had a little treat ready for when, you know, the ball dropped. And my girls had these little fancy cookies that they had. I can't remember what my husband had. And, a, and I had a Reese's peanut butter cup. I hadn't had a piece of candy in a year and Reese's peanut butter cups are my favorite. And so that's what I had. I had one and it was totally anticlimactic and I went to bed. <laughs> and after that, I write in the book, it was actually in some ways harder after the year was over because all the rules went out the window and we had to start over again from scratch and figure out, well, what do we do now? You know, now are, we don't want to go all the way back to where we were before, obviously. We don't want this to have all been for nothing, but we don't want to be quite as insanely fanatical as we've had to be this past year. And so over time, you know, you should have seen me, I write that um, me and the girls uh, went to the supermarket for the first time after the year of no sugar was over, and it was like, you know, we were from outer space or something. They were like, can we get that? Can we get, can we get cereal? Can we get cold cuts? Can we get, you know, mayonnaise? And it was like everything was on the table again. And it was like they'd never been in a supermarket before. <laughs> and I, I found it very, very challenging, but ultimately we came to a place over time where we are now, and we still are, um, where I still refuse to buy products that contain sugar, especially if they shouldn't, if they don't need it, if it's not sweet. I don't buy any products at the store. I cook and bake still quite a bit at home, as much as I can. Um, I do know when I, can't, when I don't have time to make my own bread or my own tomato sauce, I know where I can find those products in the store, the one bread, the one tomato sauce, and I purchase those. Um, my, uh, when it is somebody's birthday, we will have a real sugar-containing dessert often. 
uh, other special occasions. Um, but what we do is we treat sugar as a real special treat. It's, it's small and it's very infrequent. Uh, an interesting way to illustrate this, my daughter Greta, um, she was 11 when we did the project, she's now 14. She had her birthday a few weeks ago and she said, Mom, I want, I want you to make me chocolate cake. And I write about this chocolate cake in the book. She always wants this one chocolate cake. It's an old recipe from my grandmother. And I made the cake and she said, and no sugar substitutes, I want real sugar, no fruit, none, you know, don't you? She was on to me. So I made her the real recipe with the real amount of sugar and she had a piece and she didn't feel good afterwards and I felt kind of bad and she said, it's okay, it's worth it, just for this, you know. But what was interesting, we all had our piece of cake on her birthday and after that the rest of the cake sat in the fridge. This never would have happened in other years. The cake always disappeared rather quickly. <laughs> um, finally, a little more than a week later, I went back and looked at it and there was like little fuzz. There was, you know, growing on the strawberries. They were totally molding. And I went, I'm going to have to throw the rest of the cake out. This never happened before. So I thought that was a very interesting uh, thing to observe, that we're in a very different place now than we had been before we began our year of no sugar. Um, something that I like to talk about also is people often ask me, well, if I want to try cutting down on sugar in my diet, where should I start? How should I do it? And I often say that one of the best places to start, in fact, if you do nothing else, um, but you just want to do only one thing, I'd say don't drink sugar. Um, that's one of the biggest sources of excess sugar in the American diet. Um, and it's not just the obvious stuff like soda, um, it's also sports drinks and teas, it's also fruit juice. Um, we have this idea that fruit juice is healthful, but sadly when we take it into our bodies, it's doing the exact same chemical uh, thing that a soda is doing in your body. It's still going straight to your liver, still has fructose, and it's creating toxic byproducts. Um, so I hate to tell people that, um, cause, and, and it is very, uh, it's very counter to everything that we've been told for quite a while now. Um, I also say, uh, along the same lines, beware of anything people tell you is healthy. Um, because we have this common sort of agreement about which things are healthy that we buy. You know, oh, yogurt is healthy, not if it's flavored. Um, there can be as much uh, uh, sugar, added sugar, in a flavored yogurt as in a candy bar. Um, granola bars, uh, just as bad. Uh, most of them. You need to read the ingredients and sadly uh, I've now counted about 54 different names for sugar and if you want to know I have some of them, them in my book but it's a much shorter list than I have now currently compiled and if you want to see the whole list of 54 names you can go to my website which is Year of No Sugar and I also have a lot of other uh, good you know resources uh, that you can look at. Um, I have also a short slideshow of some of the products that we have come to rely on that do not contain added sugar. And I also have a list of ingredients that sound like they might be sugar, but in fact are not. They do not contain fructose. They are fine. Um, reading labels, of course. Um, and again, getting to be familiar. It's not, it's not fair, <laughs> I think. It's, too, it's, it's really not fair that we need to know 54 different names for sugar or somewhere thereabouts. Um, I don't think food should be this hard. And um, I think that that's entirely intentional. It's confusing and I think it's, I think it's intentional. Um, what I often uh, am, what makes me hopeful is the new nutrition information guideline box, the nutrition box that's going to, that is proposed to be put on packages now. Because currently it simply says sugars and it has grams. Now that could be any form of sugar, it could be lactose, glucose, it could be fructose, it could be a combination of those things. Um, but the new label that's proposed will have the sugar line and then it will also have a line that says added sugar. That's fructose, just fructose. You won't need to read the ingredient list anymore if that goes through. You won't need to know the 54 some odd different <coughs> names for sugar. You'll just read that line and you will know. So I'm very hopeful that that will happen. Um, 
Oh, I don't want to forget to mention, I don't know if you guys have heard about the movie Fed Up. Have people? Um, I got the opportunity to go see it. I got in the car with my family and we drove four hours because we're a little fanatical on the subject. And I got the opportunity to write a review for the Boston Globe. Uh, again, all of this stuff is on my website if you're curious to see it, uh, read it. Um, and I can't tell you how wonderful this movie is. It lays out the entire argument in a very concise manner. And also, it's very compelling because in, in the uh, movie, they also tell the stories of four different children. They're all between the ages of, I believe, it's 12 and 15. They're all obese, and they are all struggling and struggling, trying to lose weight, trying to do the right things with their diets, and failing. And it's just heartbreaking to hear these kids talk about how they think they might die before they're 20, how they are considering gastric, by, you know, the gastric surgery. Um, it's, and one of the kids actually ends up deciding to do the surgery, uh, which has not, uh, does not have really wonderful, it's, it's got a lot of potential complications. It doesn't have really wonderful results. A lot of the people who get the surgery gain the weight back anyway over a period of time. It's just, it's wrenching. But it's very powerful, and this is something we need to talk about. This generation of children, as I'm sure many of you are aware, is now uh, supposed to live shorter lives than their parents. Um, I'm happy to say that I took my kids to the movie, and there was one other kid in the audience. There were like 200 people there, but there was another kid, and I'm very happy to see a kid here tonight. <laughs> Um, because this issue is too important. And that brings me to another subject, and then I'll probably shut up. Um, but um, the kids and sugar. This is one of the things that I think captivates a lot of people about our story, is that we, the kids did it too. And that we have this sort of um, myth that kids and sugar are never to be separated, that to separate them is almost tantamount to child abuse, that being a kid means you get a certain, you know, your, your, your God-given uh, right to a certain amount of sugar is part of being a kid. And I'm happy to be here to tell you, a lot of people have asked me, do your kids hate you now? And I'm like, no, they don't hate me. I mean, really, you ask them, they don't hate me. They, and they um, don't feel like our year of no sugar was this horrible thing, even. Um, in fact, in the book, uh, you'll see that Greta, who was, again, she was 11. She, my other daughter was not old enough to do this, but Greta was. She kept a journal during the year. And I asked her if she wanted to share it with me, I would love to read it. And she let me, which was lovely. And then she also gave me permission to put pieces of it in the book. So the highlights are in the book. And it is this wonderful window into the 11-year-old perspective on what a project like this means. And she's all over the place. You know, one minute she's saying, this is so interesting and wonderful. It makes our family unique and special. And how can my friends not understand how important what we're doing is? And I hate you, mom. You're ruining my life. She's all over the place, sometimes in a single sentence. She's up and down and sideways. She's everywhere. And I think that that's totally accurate, especially for a kid. I mean, I felt that way, too. There were wonderful days and really difficult days. And, but the longer we did it for it, my younger daughter, I tried because she couldn't keep a journal. I tried my best to record whenever she would say something interesting about the project. And I have lots of quotes from her and stories about her in the book. And one of the things she said that really uh, impresses me the most, and she continues to say it when asked today, when people ask her, uh, well, wasn't it hard? Wasn't it really, really just excruciatingly hard? And she'll go, well, at first it was hard. But then, you know, after we got used to it, it was really no big deal. And that's, you know, from a young kid. We did go trick-or-treating. I have a whole chapter in the book about Halloween. We didn't want to, you know, we did go out to restaurants. We did celebrate with our family, and we went to social uh, events. That was part of the point. You know, some people say, why did you, you even try to go to a restaurant? It would be so hard. Why did you even try? Because that's the whole point, is we weren't going to live under a rock. You could, you know, you can do anything if you're just going to go off and live on an iceberg, you know. But to, to be uh, not miserable and still do all the things that we wanted to do while being very aware of our food and what was in it um, was a big goal for our year. 
So planning ahead is important. That's another good tip, uh, especially when you're traveling. We all know how difficult convenience stores can be to find actual, real, edible food. Um, I do think things are getting better, I'm happy to say, because I have noticed since our year, when we go to places like convenience stores, you know, some of it is just a matter of tuning, you know, uh, your, your, what you're looking for a little bit. Now you can buy things like you can buy bananas at the convenience store. You can buy cheese sticks at the convenience store. Every once in a great while, I'll, I'll see they have those hummus things with pretzels in the container like this, and you open it up. We could have those. So, you know, there are, there are alternatives. It's not totally impossible. And if all else fails, you know, uh, you bring something in your bag. I did that plenty. Um, all of these things, it's, it's a matter of simply uh, shifting our perspective a little bit and having a greater awareness. I'm not trying to eradicate sugar from the face of the earth. I don't think that's necessary. Um, but I do think that it's really important for people to have a greater awareness of things such as the fact that when you go to the supermarket, three quarters of the items available for sale have added sugar in them that uh, out of our total sugar intake, only half of it is from obvious sources. Oh, the cookies and the soda and the cake. Half of it is hidden sugar, 50%. So essentially, you're eating twice as much sugar as you're aware of. I think we have a, a, a right to know what's in our food, to um, know what we're eating, and then make our own decisions. You know, some people know all about you know how bad other things are for us such as tobacco or alcohol and we all make our own decisions about those things sugar should be the same way sugar needs to be in that same category it's something that we can have but we need to have all the information so we can make better decisions about it um, so can i answer any questions yeah yes when i baked for example bread at home uh, I did not use sugar. That's another thing that I have found. A lot of people think you need to use sugar to feed the yeast to make bread. That's not so. You can make bread perfectly well with flour, yeast, salt, and water. Um, I also did, and I write about this in the book, there are recipes in the book. I did a lot of experimenting, um, and I did things like I used, uh, we didn't, we didn't want to necessarily never have anything sweet just because we were getting away from fructose. So we would take, say, mashed banana and put that in a recipe, and I would experiment and see if I could get a decent cookie, uh, you know, a decent, um, I made these um, apricot bars, apricot date bars that uh, the recipe is in the book. Um, those came out really well. I, I was amazed because I had always been a very literal cook and baker. I love to cook, I love to bake, but I was the kind of person that if a recipe called for a quarter teaspoon of tarragon and I didn't have tarragon, then I wasn't making that recipe. I was very literal. And I had to let go of all of that and I had to say, I'm going to just experiment and see what I can come up with. And I was amazed to find that there were so many recipes that I was sure would just absolutely disintegrate and be useless and I'd be scraping them into the trash because I had left out a tablespoon of sugar. And of course, that didn't happen at all. Um, then I graduated on to doing things um, that can, you know, called for more sugar, and I had to get creative. And that's when the mashed banana came in, and mashed sweet potato, unsweetened applesauce. And then I started discovering other things. At the health food store, you can find uh, barley malt syrup. You can fi find brown rice syrup. Those are great substitutes for anything that's viscous, like a honey or a molasses. Um, I also discovered, uh, again, through the help of David Gillespie, the Australian author, the use of dextrose. Dextrose uh, is glucose, and it is made from corn. It is about a third the sweetness of table sugar, and it also works very well. It's a sweetener, but you have no fructose. How about substituting sweet oil? We did make a decision early on in the project. We decided that we weren't going to go with any of the artificial sugars that were on the market, and that was mainly due to uh, potential side effects that can be related to them. And there, you know, we thought, you know what, it's sugar's bad enough. We don't want to get, get into, and we've been using sugar as a society for, you know, decades, you know, uh, 
for a very long time. These other things are relatively new and they already have potential side effects that are a little controversial. We wanted to just get away from all of that. Same goes for sugar alcohols. So maltitol, xylitol, potential gastric side effects um, that are negative. You know, we just went, we're gonna stay away from all that and we're just gonna go with stuff like brown rice, you know, and banana and so on. So we stayed away from all of those things. Uh, there were some restaurants that there were a few times I was suspicious and that that was tough because of course we're relying you know on on their say so and that was pretty much you know we were like okay if they say there's no sugar in it we're gonna take their word for it but yeah I'm pretty sure that there were there were moments um, you know there was one time in particular I write about in the book where I, I ended up we were at the Thai restaurant and I ended up with something that I was like okay this totally has honey in it I know there's honey in it so it yes that absolutely happened there are also times when we did things we've made mistakes you know at the beginning of our project we thought for example that balsamic vinegar would be fine um, turns out that it's not fine it has fructose it's again yeah I know um, uh, carob I used carob chips instead of chocolate chips until I realized that carob's not fine either, sadly. Um, but you know, another thing that, uh, a thing that is fine, uh, wine. Wine is fine. And I was very happy to realize that. And the reason for that, even though it's coming from fruit juice, uh, all of that fructose, as long as it's not a sweet wine, uh, is getting converted uh, to, in the fermentation process to alcohol. So it's a different poison, but it's one, you know, that we're, uh, that we're, a little bit, I think, we have more experience dealing with in our society and recognizing that that's what it is. Um, so during, yes, I would say if you're avoiding fructose, I would not worry much about wine. If there's fructose in it, it's an infinitesimally small amount. Mm -hmm. In the case of maple syrup, it's the tree sap that's boiled down, boiled down, boiled down, boiled down. You're extracting that fructose. I mean, if we drank tree sap, maybe it'd be fine. But because it's so concentrated, you're getting a ton of fructose there. Um, also, honey, the bees are doing the process for us. They're extracting it from the nectar. Um, so again, uh, sadly, they're all doing the same thing when they're going into your body. Like there are the biological cravings, and then there are the emotional cravings and the sort of, you know, more um, conceptual cravings. And that, for me, was per much harder than any biological. Yes, there were cravings at the beginning, but that subsides. And I've heard other people talk about this as well. After a relatively short period of time, only a couple, maybe two weeks, you know, give or take. Um, but, but the metaphor of food is so ingrained and so much more. You know, we use sugar for so many things to mark occasions, to celebrate, to cheer us up, to express love and affection and, you know, so many things. And, and with kids, it's even more so. You know, how many grown-ups delight in making a kid smile by giving them a piece of candy or some other form of sugar? I mean, it's so well-meaning, you know, and that's one of the hardest things, I think. And again, I think it's a matter of awareness and uh, an understanding. You know, I, I tell the story in the book about going to, uh, there was a fundraising event in my town, and a, the general store had burned down. And it was very traumatic for our community because it was just, it was overnight, and, and it was gone. And everybody just, there was this outpouring of support for the two store owners. and everybody wanted to help and what can we do so they had this huge event and everybody's doing something and they had the local band came and played and they had a um, gigantic bake sale <laughs> and so my good friend Rhonda was there and she was one of the organizers of this event and every you know lots of other stuff going on big huge barbecue buffet and and silent auction and you name it they were doing it and, um, but, but she was cataloging all of the, literally, like there was a football field of sugar on the tables in, this, in the firehouse. And I came up to her and I was kidding her because she was reading my blog and I said, I should take a picture of this for my blog. And she went, oh no, but this is, this is good. And I went, yeah, 
See, so it's one thing when you're attacking big sugar, big faceless, nasty guys, you know, in their office somewhere. But when you're attacking the lovingly baked cookies of some little grandma who, you know, is trying to help, that's, that's a whole different ball game, right? And unfortunately, our bodies don't know the difference. So it's, it, that's, it's that much tougher. You know, it's, it's easy to get mad that there's sugar in my mayonnaise, you know. But then it's, it's harder to deal with the, the, the metaphor of food, you know, the expression of love. Sugar is love, you know, that's what we do. And um, I, <laughs> uh, for stuff like Easter, you know, fortunately the Easter Bunny got the memo. And that year uh, and since, the Easter Bunny uh, brought no... Uh, sweets in the basket. Instead, we had crayons and coloring books and little stuffed animals and seeds to plant, you know, flower seeds to put in the garden, you know. And I was on the radio recently, and uh, the fe- you know, I, I was telling the radio interviewer this story, and he was like, oh man, you know, kids everywhere hate you, you know. <laughs> and I was like, no, really? You know, I don't I don't think so. It's a matter of changing our expectations, I think, because I was still expressing affection and love and celebrating. And my kids, they, they were fine with it. They really were. Um, I, I like to tell the story also of um, and uh, when we, got to, we had the opportunity to go on the Dr. Oz show. And the girls came with me. And they were part of the story. And they were really excited to be on TV and to be in a real studio and everything. And so they had prepared some of the recipes from my book. And they had the girls you know, talk about them. And again, this is on my website if you're curious to see it. Um, so, so Ilsa's talking about the banana ice cream, which is a great thing. All you do is you take bananas and you chop them up and you freeze them for an hour and a half, you put them in a blender, and you get soft serve ice cream. And it's so good, nobody can believe there's no sugar in it. You have to make sure they're really ripe, and you don't want to leave them in the freezer for longer because then you get like ice chip banana ice thing. But at any rate, that's the easiest recipe in the book. Um, so Ilse is talking about that, and then Greta's talking about the apricot date bars. And then it's all over, and everybody's you know, leaving and going to, on to the next segment, whatever it is. And Greta and Ilse are standing there, and they're like, can, can we take these? Can we take these? And they're like, yeah, you can take them. So they're like, you know? <laughs> And I was like, see, we're not kidding. They really like this. This is for real. They, you know, I'm not just, you know, putting you all on. I mean, we really enjoy because our threshold for sweet has been brought down, 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 down. So that we'll have, we'll be having, for example, mashed sweet potato, you know, with our whatever for dinner, you know, maybe a little piece of meat or something. And my daughter Ilsa will turn to me and go, this is really sweet. There's nothing in it but sweet potato. So again, that's Michael Moss writes about this in his book, Sugar, Salt, Fat. Um, and he says it's also true of salt, uh, that our threshold for these uh, flavor enhancers, you know, we have some, and then you need more to get that same, you know, and in the case with sugar, you're lighting up those pleasure centers in your brain, the same ones that light up when people do heroin and cocaine. Um, so it's, it's the same idea that as, as an addictive drug, sugar is addictive, um, that to get that same effect, you need more the next time and more after that and more after that. And of course, we're Americans. So if a little is good, more is better, and more than that is better still, right? So very quickly, we end up way up here where nothing registers but like chocolate-covered cotton candy. Um, and what I, I love is the, is the realization that that's not permanent. We can bring that back down by ourselves, you know. So now, if we go to a restaurant, my family, and it's a special occasion, my family might order one dessert, and all four of us will share it. And we'll each get maybe two bites or three bites. And those are the best bites of any dessert anyway, the first two or three. And that's how we kind of keep it in check and don't start going back up that escalator, you know.
Yeah. I, I try as often as I can to make sure people understand that the message of Year of No Sugar is not a diet plan. This is not my solution to everything. This is not, you know, the cure-all. And I'm certainly not proselytizing that we should ban sugar from the face of the earth. I don't consider uh, my message whatsoever to be like, this is the new thing that we should all stop eating, you know. Um, Instead, again, you know, uh, I'm, I'm thinking awareness and everybody makes their own decision about it after that. But first we need to have that awareness that this sugar, you know, oh, well, we know it's not good for us. But if we really knew that it's not a harmless pleasure, that it is harmful, that it falls in that category of things that are toxic, you know, I still have a glass of wine at night with my dinner, um, you know, that's a choice I make. I know that it's a toxin. I know that too much of it would be extremely bad for me. But I make that choice and everybody, uh, everybody can do so accordingly. But those kids in that film, in Fed Up, they're not given the information and they're not able to make that choice. Um, and in the movie, as well as in Dr. Robert Lustig's book, which is entitled Fat Chance, and I highly recommend that as well. He makes, that's, you know, my book, uh, I consider sort of, you know, you've got Dr. Lustig over here, and his is a doctor book, and he makes all the arguments. He also makes policy recommendations. I don't know if you've read his book, but it's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, my book is the other side. This is the personal side of trying to go without sugar, and so I see them as very much complementing one another. Um, but again, the, the movie also makes policy recommendations and talks about things like, well, what if we had warning labels on products that contained excessive amounts of sugar? You know, we, that's what we do with alcohol. That's what we do with tobacco. Um, we've got obese babies in our culture. You can't tell me those babies need to get more exercise. They don't walk yet. <laughs> so what is it we're doing? This is what we're doing wrong. That's, that's one of the, you know, $10,000 questions, I think, is, is, the, is the kids and the huge availability. I mean, I was astounded during our year of no sugar because the kids would come home and tell me every time sugar had been offered to them, especially at school, but other places, play dates, events, whatever. And I was like, oh my gosh, when I'm not around, I had no idea how much sugar is getting thrown at my kids because I never had a reason to know uh, before this. Um, and we had a rule. We had a lot of rules. We had a rule about this, which was that if everybody around you was having a treat, you know, you're at a birthday party, everybody's having a piece of cake, whatever, the decision on whether or not to have that treat that everyone else is having would be up to you. And the only caveat there was you have to come home and tell mom about it because it's part of the research. And no guilt, no repercussions, you know. The last thing I wanted to do was encourage them to lie to me uh, to, you know, sneak around. And I said, no, 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 this is all above board. You can tell me anything. And amazingly, sometimes they really did choose not to have it. Sometimes they had it, sometimes they didn't. And for me, a lot of it was about trying to get to a place where they could make those decisions and have all that information themselves for when I wasn't there. But you're totally right that it is huge. And again, you come off, uh, in, in the worst case scenario as the big party pooper who's just, you know, you make your kitty tofu and carrots for breakfast and, you know, you're this mean, mean mom. And um, even at the farmer's market, you know, Halloween weekend, we went to the farmer's market, which is, you know, the source of all things wonderful and pure and organic and, and every table, every table had a bowl of candy for my kids. And every table we turned them down and they were like, this doesn't happen. My mom, went to get her, you know, annual mammogram and she had to wait a long time and the woman goes, oh, you were so good to wait. Here, have some Hershey's Kisses. And I'm like, this never ends. You know, this is this sugar inflation that we all suffer from. You know, when I was a kid, we'd go out for ha Halloween and we'd get one piece of candy at each house. Now, you get several pieces of candy at each house and that's if they haven't made up the little bag of candies that they give you, you know, now Valentine's Day. Instead of getting a Valentine, you get a Valentine with candy stapled to it. It's gone completely off the scale. And unfortunately, I don't have a super like, you know, uh, one size fits all solution, except again, the awareness. And 
talking about it. It was very funny. I went to, my, my daughters do Girls on the Run. And uh, my younger daughter, Ilsa, I went to pick her up from practice. And they had been running laps, you know. And for every lap they did, they got a little piece of candy. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was, like, it was like a gummy bear, you know. And it was so interesting to me because I showed up. And the coach, you know, Ilsa's going, well, look, we got candy for every lap we did, you know. And the coach comes over and she says, yes, and I counted it up. And the most any kid could ever get is 10 grams. Like, she was ready for me. She, she's like, oh, boy, here she comes, you know. And I was really like, oh, that's good. She thought about it. She was ready for me. You know, she knew how much she was giving those kids. And I thought, that's a step. That's good. You know, that's, that's the, you know. I love our school. You know, I love the fact that they're doing these special events. I love the fact that the teachers want to give the kids hot cocoa with their reading time. But we have to understand that maybe it would be better if we did something else. You know, so again, it's a matter of having these conversations. Uh, the fed up people uh, are, you know, they're doing lots of social media stuff and doing tweets. And they've been talking a lot about getting kids to see the film and getting principals interested and getting teachers interested. And I think, again, all of this, you know, it's all different pieces to, to, to the bigger picture. So another thing I got to do was, um, you know, after doing Dr. Oz, I got asked to go appear on Fox and Friends. And I wasn't super familiar with the show, um, but I, I go in and I'm in, you know, this is in New York City. And so I go in and I'm sitting in the green room and there's one other guy in there, and he's in his, you know, suit and his tie and everything. And, you know, he, we're, all, we're both waiting. And he looks at me and he says, are we on the same segment? And I was like, I wasn't aware there was somebody else on my segment. No, I don't think we are. Um, why? What are you here to talk about? And he said, guns. <laughs> and I went, no, I'm not. No, I'm not on that segment. <laughs> I, and he said, what are you here to talk about? And I said, sugar. And he said, subsidies? And I went, no, not subsidies. <laughs> so there are lots of, you know, different perspective, totally different way to think about it. So that's, that's, every, that's my Fox and Friends story. <laughs>